Hi everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Pankaj Dhingra, a proud fin trammer and a faculty for DPIFR exam. Welcome. Welcome friends. Welcome to the another session of DPIFR exam. I would say another session in your journey of becoming an expert in this exam. Now what do we have in store today? By now we have covered various IFRSs my friend and that too in depth. Now today we are getting on to the IFRS 6 my friend the exploration and the evaluation of the mineral resources yes my friend this is a relatively easier topic and an easier IFRS as compared to what all we have covered by now but I can tell you one thing examiner at times tests you on this my friend he gives you a small question on this wherein he tests your understanding about how would you account for in the case of mineral resources that is the reason my friend we will get into the details we'll get into the nerves of it but before we really jump in there what is that that we always do sir we revise the prior session sir so that's the mantra of intram follow sir we do not go ahead until and unless we have revised the prior session sir you're absolutely right my friend i'm loving you for that that's what we always do we have to revise my friend all of these topics so that they can really get on to get into our blood and we are completely there from the examination standpoint let's go and have a revision of the last session and then we'll kick start with the ifrs 6 shall we start yes sir all righty let's revise fundamental ethical and professional principles the principles which any and every professional accountant has to demonstrate in anything and everything that he does my friend these are the mantras my friend these are the principles that you should be engraving on yourself and i said that like a broken record you should never 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 forget that all right what have we covered in that ifac international code of ethics specifically says for these principles we have covered the section 100 110 to 115 and 120 now these are the principles my friend that have been recently added on to the dip i for a syllabus areas hence it is all the more important my friend from your examination standpoint if he really likes to test you over there and that is the reason my friend we have really got into the details of it to really understand as to what those principles are and how should we be demonstrating that and if we don't do that then what would be the repercussions we in fact done that with the help of an example also my friend which was the industry example and we'll touch that today or two all right what have we covered section 110 says the fundamental principles we know that sir what are those all right a professional accountant shall comply with each of the fundamental principles we know that there are five fundamental principles of the ethics for a professional accountant can you please name that sir are you really questioning us yes my friend can you please guess that sir it is nothing but the copip sir we remember the copip sir we are not gonna be forgetting that i'm loving you for that what did we cover there always remember the copip my friend this is the mnemonic you really have to have for all of the principal standpoint from all of the principal standpoint you should not be forgetting this all right what did we cover in this sir we covered the first one to be integrity what does that mean to be straightforward and honest sir in any and all professional and business relationship we have covered this at length sir just to ensure that we are able to demonstrate integrity in anything and everything that we do after that after that we learned the objectivity sir that's the o of copip sir we have learned in terms of how one would need to show the objectivity and how important it is sir not to compromise my friend on the professional or business judgment because of the biasness conflict of interest or undue influence of the others please ensure that you are not not in a situation wherein your decision making is biased because of anything that is not a situation to really get in you have to be objective my friend in anything and everything that we do and we have learned that with the help of various examples too Alrighty, then then we learned the professional competence and the due case sir. that's the p of copip sir we learned that in terms of you know what do we really need to carry from the standpoint of professional competencies all right one has to attain and maintain professional knowledge and skill at the level required to ensure that the client 
or the employing organization receives competent professional service based on the current technical and professional standard and relevant legislation now my friend you doing the diploma in ifrs course is also a step in that direction wherein you are keeping yourself updated with the various ifrs across the world so that you're there from the standpoint of implementing anything and everything that ifrs has to do with it that is what my friend everybody has to do because you always have to be on your front foot by knowing all of the recent recent changes and of course being the technical competent person over there to manage anything and everything that may come your way yes sir alrighty sir we know that sir act diligently my friend and in accordance with the applicable technical and the professional standards that's why you're learning this my friend to demonstrate anything and everything that is required on this ground is that clear yes sir then we moved on to the c of copip sir we did the confidentiality alrighty to respect the confidentiality of the information acquired as a result of professional and business relationship you just can't get away with that my friend you are in the capacity my friend wherein you would always get get exposed to the information which no one would ever have you have to keep that confidential that is the basic basic thing that you would need to follow we know that sir that is something really in our blood sir i'm loving you for this all right moving on to the professional behavior all right what did we learn in this to comply with the relevant laws and regulation and avoid any conflict that may come your way that the professional accountant knows or should know would bring the discredit to the profession you should never 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 get into the situation my friend wherein you are bringing the discredit to the profession by doing something you have to demonstrate the professional behavior in anything and everything that you may do now these are not something new to you my friend we all have been knowing this somewhere in some shape or format that we have to demonstrate all of these traits because all of these traits are very essential for any professional to really operate out of the world that they really want to and that is what you should always always be aspiring for all right then then we learned sir the impact of the unethical behavior this was huge sir and of course with the example that we learned we learned that you know what the world com was saying over there and we have got into the detail my friend the reason i pick up these examples in our sessions is that you should really know what is happening in the practical industry the way we discuss world com in terms of knowing i would say a to z as to what happened in world com the only reason is that you should really get the practical hold of it in terms of you know what is really happening in the industry and what all are these professional accountants like you know we have the scott over here and then bernard over here as the ceo what did they do of course they should not have done that because they doing this really really led to the fall of worldcom at large and why they did it how they did it is something is now being a history but that is a learning for you my friend to really know as to what they have done is something that should not be repeated and that's where these stories these these incidents are very important my friend for you for me as a professional to really learn from it and ensure that we are not repeating the same mistake again we have got into the details of this case my friend in terms of taking that to the nerves as to what exactly you need to understand as to what did they do and what they should not have done and what would or what did that lead to in terms of the punishment that they got on it that is something my friend i would say is a learning for all of us and we should all learn from that is that clear yes sir i would say never forget this practical case my friend because knowing these cases at times are very helpful in the exam because examiner not would would not only give you the theory question on this he would give you a practical question my friend a real life scenario wherein you have to apply your brain apply the ifrss apply these principles apply the threats that you may see and then understand what kind of safeguards that you may have what is the alternative course of action that you may have is that clear yes sir now what did we learn in this we said various professional disciplinary proceedings have been brought against the individual members who were believed to have fallen short of the ethical standards expected from them and that is where we learned this example yes sir many accountants have been fined or jailed for fulfilling their professional duties never forget the world com my friend i would underline this never 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 forget the world com the enrons of the world the world coms of the world are the greatest and the biggest examples 
of something wherein somebody has not operated or have not shown the ethics, one should certainly, certainly not do that. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Alrighty. Moving on to the threats and safeguards. We also covered the threats and the safeguards. Let's go and check that too. Alrighty. Threats to compliance with the fundamental principle fall into one or more of the following categories. And that is what we have discussed at length, my friend, that these threats are like the yellow lights. And if you get to see one, you have to have to have to take an action there and then. And that is what we have really gone into the details. All right. What all were the threats? Number one, the self-interest threat, my friend, the threat that a financial or the other interest will be a will inappropriately influence the professional accountant judgment or the behavior and that's where my friend you have to be 100% sure that what you're doing is not attracting or inviting the self-interest threat if that really happens then you have to take the corrective action there and then already then we touched upon the self-review threat the threat that the professional accountant would not appropriately evaluate the result of the previous judgment made or an activity performed by an accountant. It may happen, my friend, if you're not segregating the duties, this is the most common thing that happens. We have done that with the help of an example too. And by another individual within the accountant's firm or employing organization on which the accountant will rely when forming the judgment as part of the performing a current activity. And that's where the safeguard really have to come in play. Please note that, my friend, if you get to see a situation wherein you are under the self-review threat, you have to take the safeguard there and then. Yes, sir. Then we touched upon the advocacy threat, a threat that the professional accountant will promote the client or the employing organization position to the point that our accountant's objectivity is compromised. If that is the case, just have it, have it there for you, my friend. You have to take the corrective action. You just can't sit over it. Advocacy threat can really push you back in terms of people really coming on to you and saying that what you have done is not something that is being expected out of you. All right, moving on to the familiarity threat, my friend. You knowing, you knowing the people more than more than what you should should know in terms of you know you having such a kind of a threat, my friend, wherein people are bound to believe that there is something that is happening in between you and him or her which is not seemingly right which is like a threat that is due to the long or close relationship with the client if that is the case somebody would believe that there is something not happening right from your audit standpoint if you are auditing that organization all right or employing organization a professional accountant will be too sympathetic they may believe that to their interest or to accepting of their work and and of course, in that case, you have to have to think about my friend, what should you be doing from the safeguarding standpoint we will come upon a while my friend in terms of you know, what you should be doing, but it is very important that you should not miss on that. Is that clear? And in the last my friend, we have the intimidation threat, my friend. Now this is the threat which is very common in the accountancy world, wherein the threat that the professional accountant will be deterred from acting objectively because of the actual or the perceived pressures that he may really get into, including attempt to exercise undue influence over the accountant. If that happens, you are not, not able to take the right decisions or give the right work that the, that the industry really wants, that the people really wants at large. And if that is not happening, you are again heading towards having something like the world comms of the world or the environs of the world. That is something you really have to take care of that. How would you do that? We have also covered that wherein we'll say, take the steps, my friend, maintain the record to demonstrate and prove otherwise, use a separate staff if the need is, then discuss the issue with the audit committee. If possible, do that and document that too. And then consult with the third party like ACCA, you have to have a discussion with various regulatory bodies that are around. ACCA can be one of it and then resign from the engagement, my friend, if you're not able to if you're not able to take the decision that this would be right in terms of you know staying with the organization then just get out of that arrangement is that clear yes sir that was what we have covered at length my friend as far as these principles are concerned and as i said these are the recent ones my friend in terms of you know the additions that has happened to the to the syllabus area you may get to see one in the exam too my friend if they really want to ask this they can give you a practical scenario 
wherein there can be a question on the principal in terms of you know principal being violated or the threat being there as an accountant you have to carve it out my friend you have to call it out and of course till the right safeguard till the right course of action is that clear yes sir should we move on and start out with the proceedings of the day yes sir all righty moving on to the ifrs 6 that deals with the exploration and evaluation of mineral resources now to give you some context when this ifrs really came in this came in for plugging in the gap that was there at that point in time wherein is 38 was not helping as to how you should be accounting for the exploration and evaluation of the mineral resources would that be research or development and so on and so forth there was no clarity on that that is the reason ifrs 6 was being bought in at that point in time it was an interim standard that point in time which was to be replaced or was to be i would say changed over a period of time but that never happened it still stays there and we still have ifrs 6 that deals with this as a topic what does it really says let's go and jump in onto it all right what is the reason behind issuing the ifrs 6 we spoke on that ifrs 6 was introduced and it's an interim standard intended to be short-term solution to the problem of accounting in that particular area all right it is related to the is 38 distinction between the research and development phase where research costs are expensed and development costs are capitalized that is the overall base of this ifrs we'll see that in detail in a while all right the problem is that the exploration for and the evaluation of mineral resources is not quite a research and not quite a development that was a big time issue there and at that point in time hence the need of ifrs 6 really came in into picture got it sir now what is the scope of this let's go and circle that entities must apply ifrs 6 to all exploration and evaluation expenditures incurred all right but does not address other aspect of their accounting i'll read that again for you entities must apply frs6 for all exploration and evaluation expenditure incurred for that ifrs6 is there but not for anything else but does not address any other aspects of their accounting else then these two specific areas I for a six doesn't cover anything else. Is that clear? Yes, sir. I for a six only applies, only applies where entity has obtained legal rights to explore in the specific area. But before the extraction has been demonstrated to be both technically feasible and commercially viable, I would say this is the most important aspect of the standard. You should certainly, certainly circle this out that IFRS 6 only applies wherein you have obtained the legal right to explore. If you have not, not got that legal right, you cannot apply IFRS 6 onto it. Please note that. All right. But before the extraction, before really extraction has really proved to be commercially viable and technically feasible. Once that happens, then also IFRS 6 really phases out. I do have a diagram over here, a chart over here that really explains that. And I really want you to know this because many of the times examiner can really test us on that and check that. Do you really know as to when and where the IFRS 6 really applies? All right. What is must to remember over here? Cost incurred when there is no legal right. When there is no legal right, you cannot apply IFRS 6 in that case. There is no IFRS and hence you would just expense that off and you'll move on. There is no legal right, no IFRS 6, no IFRS 6 in that case, no, no, no capitalization, just expense it off and move on. Just expense it off and move on. All right. When you have obtained the legal right to explore, but before the extraction has demonstrated to be both technically viable and commercially feasible, or I would say otherwise, commercially viable and technically feasible in that case ifrs 6 really gets into the picture and you can apply that we'll see as to how do you really apply that but what is more important right now at this point in time is to understand as to when the ifrs 6 ifrs 6 would really apply it on all right once the extraction has demonstrated to be both technically feasible and commercially viable 
IS 38 really gets into the picture, then it becomes the research and development expense and you would take on accordingly. I will repeat my friend, this diagram effectively, effectively explains in terms of how you should be dealing off as an, as an activity if there is an expense that is being related to this area, how would you deal with that over a period of time is something that is being explained till the time you have the legal right, you will just expense it off. Once you have the legal right, you will apply IFRS 6 and move on. Once you have the IFRS 6 being applied there and over a period of time you have proved that whatever you are doing is technically feasible and commercially viable in that case you would now move on to the IS 38 and you will start applying the same. Please, please do not forget this, these phases. Very important from the examination standpoint. He loves to place around this and I do have an examination question, the past examination question that I really want to discuss today on. All right, moving on my friend in terms of, you know, what these expenditures are. Let's go and read that and I'm pretty sure you would circle that out in terms of, you know, what the overall expenses would look like. All right, the exploration and evaluation expenditures are expenditures incurred by an entity in connection with an exploration for and evol evaluation of the mineral resources. If you really have to look for in terms of, you know, when and where you should be exploring on or of course, you know, doing the exploration on, you have to do if technical feasibility, the evaluation of that and of course, start exploring that. That is what is being covered in the exploration and evaluation, all right, before the technical feasibility and the commercial viability of extracting the mineral resources is demonstrable. Do not, do not forget that. All right, the exploration and evaluation assets are exploration and evaluation expenditures recognized as a set in accordance with the entities accounting policies you may be expensing off few things and you may be capitalizing what you're capitalizing becomes your exploration and evaluation asset do not forget that all right exploration for and evaluation of mineral resources is a search for mineral resources including mineral oil natural gas and similar non regenerative resources after the entity has obtained the legal rights to explore in a specific area as well as determination of the technical feasibility and commercial viability of extracting the mineral resource that is what the entire activity is all about and that is what you need to know in the exam if you get a situation wherein you are contemplating in terms of how you should be approaching this as an activity considering that you're really contemplating a business and you're really moving on how you should be doing an accounting something that this standard basically tells you this will effectively tell you in terms of you know what cost you can capitalize what cost you need to expense off which standard works over there that is something that examiner is really interested in he will not not give you a big time question on that but he really wants to understand that do you really understand the standard or not do you really understand as to what impacts where or not all right moving on to the recognition expenditure my friend in this case is recognized as an asset for ifrs 6 until the technical feasibility and commercial viability of extracting resources can be demonstrated do not forget that all right note that this also means that entity must have necessary technical and financial means to extract the resources if it doesn't have that then that effectively means that you cannot capitalize this you have to have you have to have the technical and sorry financial means to extract on the resources do not forget on that all right Moving on, we have an entity can then choose its own accounting policy as long as it is in line with IES 8. Specifically, it must confirm to IES 8 paragraph 10, which states that management should use adjustment in developing an accounting policy that results in information that is relevant and reliable. After choosing their policies, policy entity must then apply the policy consistently, which is a very normal case. What you really need to know is that once you have agreed on a policy, then that has to be followed consistently and we are already, already aware of it. All right. Note that the expenditure related to the development of mineral resources must not be recognized as exploration and evaluation asset under IFRS 6 as they come under IS 38. There is a distinction that happens 
on the stage by stage basis as to what IFRS gets applied where and that is what you really need to learn. Once the technical feasibility and of course commercial viability is, is, is really proved that really switches on to IS 38. You have to start thinking about the research and development, development expense there and start doing the accounting accordingly. Is that clear? Yes, sir. All right, moving on to the measurement at recognition. Let's go and circle that. All right, the measurement at recognition. At recognition, exploration and evaluation asset must be measured at cost. Do not forget that it has to be measured at cost. The following are the examples and these are the examples specifically being given by IFRS 6. One should really, really circle them out. They circle them off because this is really important for you to really, really know this. One is the following are the examples of the expenditure an entity might incur in the initial measurement of exploration and evaluation asset. What's that? Number one, the acquisition of right to explore. Do not forget that. Topographical, geological, geochemical and geophysical studies that you may have to conduct before you really start thinking about the mineral resource. The exploratory drilling, the trenching, the sampling, the activities in relation to the evaluating the technical feasibility and commercial viability of extracting the mineral resource. All of this needs to be needs to be recognized at cost. Do not do not really forget that. Important is that you should know these line items because at times examiner gives you many line items and then you need to choose out in terms of you know what really goes where, what would be covered by the IFRS 6 and what would not be covered. Is that clear? Yes, sir. All right. An entity should also recognize the cost of any obligation of removal and, and restoration in line with the IAS 37. Important is that you should know which applies where. We'll see that with the help of a question, my friend. It's not a difficult standard. The only thing is that you should know because this is a mix of two standards that you may get to see in the exam. You should just know as to what one would need to apply which standard. Once you'll understand that, better you are from the standpoint of dealing with that kind of a scenario. We'll see that with the help of an example in a while and we'll also practice a past examination question to give you an insight as to how you should be handling something like this in the exam. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Moving on to the illustration. Let's just go and read that. Diggers Co. is a mining company currently exploring and evaluating the possibilities of extracting gold from the desert of South Africa, it has incurred the falling cost in the rendered 20x1. All right, all the figures are in thousands. Let's go one by one. Legal expenses relating to the acquisition of land in which exploration is to take place. All right, that is $15,000. Okay, all the figures are in thousands. Do not forget that. Illegal expenses relating to the acquisition of right to explore land that is twelve thousand dollars okay exploratory drilling cost of one lakh twenty nine thousand dollars general admin overhead allocated to the exploration of land in south africa that is twenty five thousand dollars and then cost of extracting the gold that is one lakh fifty two thousand dollars all right which of the following cost can be capitalized as exploration and evaluation asset in accordance with the IFRS 6. Now we know, sir, that IFRS 6 specifically talks on certain, certain costs that one can really capitalize. If we really go up, we can see that, sir, all of these are the areas wherein we can capitalize these costs specifically from the standpoint of IFRS 6, which is nothing but the acquisition of the right to explore, which is on account of topographical and geological expenses that you have on account of the studies that you do over there. And then you have the exploratory drilling that happens. You have the trenching, sir, sampling, sir, and activities in relation to the evaluating technical feasibility and commercial viability of extracting the mineral resource. We've already covered that. That is what we'll be covering, my friend. Else than these, we would not be capitalizing anything. This is what IFRS 6 specifically says, and we'll follow that. If you really go and circle this out over here, in terms of, you know, the content that is being given in this question, we can simply, simply sort out that what kind of cost would be, would be capitalized. The legal expense in relation to the acquisition of land. No, sir. Acquisition of land expenses are not to be capitalized. The 
acquisition of right expenses are to be capitalized legal expenses in relation to the acquisition of right to explore yes sir it is to be capitalized as per ifrs 6 all right the exploratory drilling cost yes sir it was categorically given over there we would be capitalizing this too the general admin over there sir nothing was given sir we would not be capitalizing that all right the cost of extracting the gold no sir there was nothing that was being given in terms of extraction cost we would be expensing this off all right the which of the above cost may be capitalized as the exploration or oh, and evaluation asset in accordance with the IFRS 6. Now he's specifically asking us about the capitalization. We have the answer that these two are the cost that we can capitalize as per IFRS 6. But what if, if he asks the question that what can you capitalize and what do you really need to expense off? And of course, what would you do with the rest of the cost as per the various IFRSs that you've learned. That's the style of examiner, my friend. That's how he generally asks the questions in the exam. In terms of he testing you that do you know it in entirety as to what you would do where. And if it does that, how can we handle that? Let's go and check that. We have covered the answers on the holistic basis as to what you should be doing for each and every line item, my friend, that you may get to see in the exam. These questions are not tough, my friend. If you really know the standard, if you really know what happens where, which cost goes where, this is a very easy one and easy marks to really get on in the exam, my friend. And if you get something like this, you would certainly, certainly be on the edge if you know the standard end to end. Is that clear? Yes, sir. If you go and check on the solution, you will have the answer. The falling cost can be capitalized in accordance with the IFRS 6. We know that, sir. We have already circled this out. Number one, the legal expenses relating to the acquisition of right. Yes, sir. Acquisition of land is not to be capitalized, sir. All right. That is $12,000. Exploratory drilling cost is to be capitalized, which is $1,29,000. These are the asset that you would create under the IFRS 6, sir. We know that, sir. The following cost cannot be capitalized in accordance with the IFRS 6 and should be expensed off. That's the second leg, my friend, if examiner really asks you. All right. What is that? The general admin expenses. If there is a general admin expenses that you're incurring on account of any exploration that you're doing over there, that needs to be expensed off. $25,000 would be straight away expensed off and you'll move on. Is that easy one? Yes, sir. Cost of extracting, my friend. If there is a cost of extracting of gold that you may incur, what would you do with that? Sir, we'll expense it off, sir. There is nothing that is being said in the IFRS 6. That is, that is something that we really need to deal with. This is the cost that really goes nowhere and we'll circle that out when we read out the note in terms of, you know, how should you be handling that? All right. There is one cost, my friend, over here, which I really want to talk on in terms of, you know, how should you be dealing with that? Because there is a specific accounting standard that deals with it. That is the cost of acquiring the right to land. The falling cost cannot be capitalized in accordance with the IFRS 6. We are pretty sure on that, but can be capitalized in accordance with the other standard. Number one, which is a very important one over here, that is the legal expense relating to the acquisition of land in which exploration is to take place. There is a note I have written over here that really tells you in terms of you know how you should be handling around this 15,000 because there is a specific accounting standard that says for the same. Let's go and read that and then we'll read out the first two. We have the note number three that really deals with it. Land is acquired before the process of exploration and evaluation begins. All right. Because by definition, the entity cannot be exploring and evaluating resources on the land it does not own. The legal expense relating to the acquisition are therefore not accounted for in relation to IFR 6. But what is the other standard that is there to really, really capitalize this as an expense? Sir, it is IS 16, sir. PPNE, sir, we have learned that, sir, wherein you really capitalize these costs, sir. I'm loving you, my friend. This is the right answer. IS 16 specifically talks on that, but are instead capitalized as part of carrying amount of the land in accordance with the IFRS IA 16. You have to have to do that this way, my friend. If he really asks you as to what you would do with the other cost, you should know that IA 16 comes to your rescue as far as dealing with the cost of land is concerned. You would be capitalized that as part of that. Is that clear? Yes, sir. What about the other two costs that we expensed off? Let's read the note on it. And I'm pretty sure you would circle that out. The general admin expenses or the overhead do not relate to the exploration and evaluation of resources and must be expensed off. There is nothing being said anywhere else 
you cannot capitalize these expenses any which ways is that clear yes sir moving on to the next one the cost of extracting the gold are incurred after the process of exploration and evaluation has ended all right and are not therefore accounted for in accordance with the IFRS 6 we know that that's the reason we have not capitalized that sir they are the cost incurred in the ordinary course of business and will likely be expensed off as they are unlikely to qualify as intangible asset as per IS 38 you can mention that you may not mention that that is absolutely fine but what is important is that you should be able to understand that once you have really set it up in terms of what you really need to do from the standpoint of IFRS 6 you are applying IAS 38 over there but if you are not able to qualify any asset to be an intangible asset for you at that point in time that needs to be expensed off like in this case this cost would not not be capitalized as intangible asset it's a normal business expense it will go to the PNL and we'll close it there is that clear yes sir these accounting standards as I said my friend are not the tough ones these are the real, real easy ones kind of a thing, my friend, that you may have in the exam. The low hanging fruits. Now, one, the only thing that you really need to do over there is you should know as to what goes where. What does this really, you know, the, the accounting standard really says? What all items it, there are, are being covered in this accounting standard? And once you know that, it is just ticking the right figure in the exam and you have the answer there and have the marks there with you. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Should we move ahead? Yes, sir. Alrighty. Going ahead, we have the measurement after recognition. Now, once you have really implemented the IFRS X and have really capitalized your asset, what should you be doing? Entities must apply either the cost model or the revaluation model as they go forward, taking the revaluation model either from the IS 16 and IS 38. Do not forget that, my friend. Once you have really capitalized as per IFRS 6, you have to go forward and see the cost or the revaluation model as we have already covered. All right, moving on to the classification and reclassification. Exploration and evaluation assets are classified as tangible asset or intangible asset according to the nature of which the assets have been acquired for yes for example drilling rights would be intangibles vehicle or drilling rigs would be tangible depending upon what you are taking as the nature of that asset all right the classification must be applied consistently that goes without saying we all know that sir number one they should no longer be classified as exploration and evaluation asset when the technical feasibility and commercial feasibility of extracting the mineral resource are demonstrable this is the first thing number one thing what we have read when we have been doing the IFRS 6 that you would not go beyond the stage wherein you have the technical feasibility and commercial viability being established any impairment loss on the asset must be recognized before reclassification let's go and check as to how you would be doing the impairment testing on that all right impairment the exploration and the evaluation asset must be assessed for impairment when the facts and circumstances suggest that the carrying amount of an asset may exceed its recoverable amount that's something we have already learned in terms of you know when the impairment really gets into the picture any resulting impairment loss must be measured presented and disclosed in accordance with the IAS 36 which is a normal normal thing that we know all right the following factors suggest exploration and evaluation assets should be tested for impairment let's at least know this you may or may not get to see these kind of questions directly but you should know in terms of you know what the IFRS really says as to where you should be testing and of course thinking about the impairment of these assets number one the period for which the entity has the expiration right has expired or is due to expire in the near future and is not expected to be reviewed. If that is the case, look forward to it. All right. Substantive expenditure on further exploration in the specific area is not budgeted or planned. Think about it. If that is the case, you may have to think about the impairment. You may have to see through whether we have the impairment or not. Do the calculation and take that accordingly. All right. Exploration in the specific area has not led to the discovery of commercially viable quantities of the material resources and the entity has decided to discontinue activities in that area. This is the most common thing that happens in the industry wherein you explore 
with the view that you will get the huge huge potential of profits and of course the mineral as a quantity but you end up not having that if that is the case what you would do you should certainly test for the impairment all right sir moving on sufficient data indicates that while the development in a specific area may proceed the carrying value of the exploration and the evaluation asset is unlikely to be recovered from the successful development and sale if that is the case think about it for impairment purposes each cash generating unit or the group of unit to which an exploration and evaluation asset is allocated must not be larger than the segment as determined by IFRS 8 operating segments. This is the normal case. We already know that from the IFRS 8 standpoint. We have already understood that, sir, any which ways. Important is that you should know what all are the areas or what all are the levers or what all are the specificities that you really need to know for you to really look for the impairment. These are what are being mentioned by the IFRS that you should know that these are the areas if they really get along your way, you know that you have to test for the impairment. You have to have to ensure that impairment loss is being recognized if you get to see one. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Moving on to one of the example, my friend, that I have. Now, this example is from the past examination paper of the diploma in IFR course. You have to know in terms of, you know, what you would be doing from the standpoint of you seeing these questions in the exam. Should we go and check that? Yes, sir. Alrighty, let's go and read that. You are the financial controller of the Omega, a listed company which prepares the consolidated financial statement in accordance with the international financial reporting standard. Your managing director, who is not an accountant, has recently attended a seminar and has raised a question for you concerning issues discussed at the seminar. Alrighty, let's go and check that as to what he really says. One of the delegates at the seminar was the director of an entity which is involved in the exploration and evaluation of the mineral resources. This delegate told me that under IFRS rules, it is possible for an individual entity to develop their own policies for when to recognize the cost of exploration and evaluation of mineral resources as the assets. Okay, this seems very strange to me. Surely IFRS requires consistent treatment all we know that we all know that sir for tangible and intangible asset yes sir so that financial statements are comparable yes sir that's right please explain the position to me and outline the relevant requirement of IFRS regarding the accounting for exploration and evaluation expenditure now this is classic he may give you a situation in the exam wherein he would throw you in a scenario which specifically ask for a standard in terms of you explaining that standard without even doing any calculation. Over here, you're not supposed to do any calculation like what you would be doing in various other questions that you may get to see in the exam. But what he really wants you to really explain over here is that do you really know the IFRS 6 or not? And do you really know the background about it in terms of, you know, how does this really came in? What was this for? What is that really saying? How would you be implementing that? What you should be doing? What you should not be doing? And so on and so forth you have to have to mention it all and that's what examiner really expects all this is not a difficult one it is basically the explanation of your understanding about the ifrs 6 that you have to go and place over there all that you need to understand is that this has to be packed up in the right way going in the step-by-step -step manner in terms of you know what ifrs really says and what this director is saying and what is the right thing in it and what is the wrong thing in it what can one do what can one not do and so on and so forth that's what we'll be writing over here. That's what examiner really wants from you. Should we go and check the answer? Yes, sir. Alrighty. If you really go on the solution, we'll start off mentioning the expenditure on the exploration for and the evaluation of mineral resources is excluded from the scope of standard, which might be expected to provide guidance in this area. Alrighty. Specifically, such expenditures not covered by I-16 property, plant and equipment or IS-38, intangible asset. All right, we know that, sir. This has meant that in the absence of any alternative pronouncements, entity should determine their accounting policy for exploration 
and evaluation expenditure in accordance with the general requirement of IAS 8. All right, that's accounting policies, changes in accounting estimates and errors. This could lead to the considerable divergence of practice given the diversity of the relevant requirement of other standard bodies. I'm only setting the stage, my friend, giving the perspective as to why and how the standard really gets into picture. Given the ISB issued IFRS 6 exploration for an evaluation of mineral resources to achieve some level of standardization of the practice in this area, IFRS 6 requires relevant entities to determine the policy specifying which expenditures are recognized as exploration and evaluation asset and apply the policy consistently. Do we know this? Yes, sir. Is that something very clear to us? Yes, sir. All right. When recognizing the exploration and evaluation asset, entities shall consistently, consistently classify them as tangible and intangible according to their nature. We know that, sir. Subsequent to the initial recognition, entities should consistently apply cost model or the devaluation model to exploration and evaluation asset. We are only explaining them why the standard really came in for. What is the standard really doing from the standpoint of accounting? What you would do in this, what you would do after this, that is what we've learned sir, that is what we're explaining over here. All right, if the devaluation model is used, it should be applied according to the IS-16 or IS-38 as the case may be. Where circumstances suggest that the carrying value of the exploration and evaluation asset may exceed the recoverable amount, such asset should be reviewed for impairment. We know that, sir. Any impairment loss should be basically be measured, presented, and disclosed in accordance with the IS 36 impairment of the asset. You're effectively explaining to your leader that this is what the standard really says this is how this gets applicable this is what you should know what the standard is all about and that's what examiner is really expecting from you by giving you question like this he effectively tests your understanding that do you really know the ifrs 6 in totality or not we are fin trammer sir we are not gonna be letting anything unturned I'm loving you, my friend, for this. That is what my intention is. That is the reason we have the past examination questions also being covered up over here too in terms of giving you an insight as to how the examiner has been testing you. And by reading the answer, we can completely, completely correlate, sir, that it is not a difficult one. We, if we know the standard, we just have to put that across in a simple, simple language and you'll be there. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Now, that's what I wanted to cover, my friend, from this overall session standpoint. We would be covering various questions also on this, you know, when we really get on and start off with the question marathon that is really coming next. We have ended all the syllabus areas of the diploma in IFR course, my friend. Now is the time to jump on onto the revision bootcamp and start practicing the question. Is that clear? Yes, sir. I'll see you again, my friend, when we'll kickstart the journey of the Question Marathon. Till then, this is Pankaj Tingra signing off.